Hi all, I'm Andrea Timpano, the editor of Boston Home, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the launch event for our annual Summer Escapes issue, which hits stands on May 18th. As many of you know, each year we devote our summer features to the area's most inspiring outdoor hangouts and vacation homes. And today we're thrilled to offer you an exclusive sneak peek at those spaces and of course the local design teams behind them. Throughout the event, you'll hear from interior designer Theron Anderson, landscape architect Dan Gordon, and architect Belinda Watt, all of whom have projects featured in the issue. You'll also spend some time with our profile subject, Donna Garlow, who will be walking you through her new home goods boutique, Monroe, which opened in Charlestown just a few short months ago. We've got lots in store for you today, so to help kick things off, I'm happy to introduce interior designer Theron Anderson, who will be sharing a short presentation on the stunning Nantucket hideaway she recently renovated for a young family. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'm so thrilled to be here. My name is Theron Anderson of Theron Anderson Design. We are based between New York and Nantucket. And the home featured in this issue is on Nantucket Island, which is a very special place to me because I actually grew up here year round. Um, the homeowner is a classmate from growing up. So I was thrilled when she asked for my help um, furnishing this home for her. So we began uh, the process late in the year and they were hoping to be in the house by the following summer. So it was a relatively tight time frame, and we focused on furnishings, um, updating all of the finishes throughout and making it family friendly. She has three young children. So it was all about um, making it beautiful, but also functional. I would love to walk you through um, some special spaces in the house and talk about some of the challenges that we experienced along the way. I'll start off by showing you an image of the exterior and walk you through some rooms with before and after images. So here you can see um, images of the facade of the home. This home is based in the Monomoy area of Nantucket, um, which is, it, it looks towards town. It's situated um, on the water in the harbor. And um, it's a very, you know, traditional shingle style home from the exterior, um, beautiful bluestone patio, pool surround. Um, this was all existing when they purchased the home. So we focused on, you know, furniture and making it functional for a young family. One of the biggest hurdles that we experienced right out of the gate of this project were uh, challenges with the floors. We originally thought that they were cherry and it turned out as we began sanding that uh, they were mahogany. And so our original hopes to bleach the floors uh, became you know, it was off the table because if we were to bleach them, it would likely turn a very pink tone over time. The mahogany would bleed through. So given the time frame that we had to work within, uh, we were in like February or March at this point. And uh, my floor guy explained the situation and said, I think that we should paint them. So we did a bunch of paint sampling and you can see here on the right, that this is the final result and it's lovely. It was actually a really happy, um, not mistake, but a, you know, a hurdle that we had to overcome. And I think it just brightened the house um, immensely. It's an older historic home and the ceilings are a little bit lower. So it really worked to our advantage to brighten things up and to make it feel more casual. Uh, because again, this is a young family, they have three young children and it's, it's, you know, it made it a lot more approachable and casual. So you can see here before and after of the um, entry and stair hall, um, the beautiful painted floors and a grass cloth wallpaper. Um, it's a geometric pattern hand painted by Sally King Benedict. And we layered in beautiful natural fibers of jute and sisal and this wrapped console with interesting um, legs and we sort of tied in um, this plaster mirror and table lamp relate to a chandelier that you'll see later in the dining room. So it feels, um, it just feels light and airy compared to what was there before. 
here is the dining room that I mentioned previously. So uh, you can see a before and after of what was there, um, the, the dark mahogany floors, um, instantly brighter. We layered in a jute rug, a beautiful lacquered Parsons console table, a uh, dining table that actually can receive a leaf. So that way when she's hosting family, um, you know, even though this is a summer home, they, they do use it um, for holidays and entertaining. So it's beautiful and light and bright. And you can see the before and after it was a very easy transformation, just utilizing uh, paint and new furnishings. The draperies are a small scale uh, block print, the uh, beautiful light and airy art and the natural fibers of the chair all feel um, beachy, but without being too nautical. Here in the living room, you can see a lot of natural light in this space, but lower ceilings and painting the floors really brightened up the room. We applied a light colored grass cloth on the walls to warm up the space and add some interest. Um, the furniture shapes are very casual. Uh, the ottoman is upholstered in a faux leather vinyl, which is, you know, family friendly, um, you know, people can kick their feet up and really feel comfortable in this space. Um, a lot of natural fibers, linen, cotton, um, jute, and some really charming little vintage stools that we found. Um, another view here, looking towards the fireplace. This was something that we did modify. The original fireplace was you know, very tall and large in scale. The proportions of the room, um, it just, it didn't quite feel right. So we removed the existing surround and just simply put a new millwork surround. We left the fireplace, um, the stone hearth around it and added in a new millwork surround that was a little bit lower and a little bit more modern. Here in the master bedroom, you can see a before and after. The architecture remained the same, but we brightened up uh, the ceiling greatly with a nice crisp white. And uh, we actually used the same flat weave jute area rug here as we did in the living room. This is one of our favorites. It's a great beach house rug and it just feels nice underfoot and it's very casual. Um, the block print of the fabric on the headboard and the bed skirt creates visual interest, but for the most part, everything is really light and airy and focuses on the beautiful outdoors and the views towards the water. This is the children's room and we inherited this shiplap uh, paneled room and it felt you know, it's very beachy. Uh, we lightened it up quite a bit and added these beautiful twin beds for sleepovers. Uh, their daughter has a cousin close in age and so they spend a lot of time together here. And that completes our presentation. Thank you so much for following along. I am so grateful to be able to share this house with you. Thank you. Thank you, Theron. I'd now like to welcome Jocelyn Main Style Director turned entrepreneur Donna Garlow, who we also had the great pleasure of interviewing this issue. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Donna opened the doors to Monroe, a brand new home goods boutique in Charlestown back in December. Today, she gives us a tour of her new space and shares a few shopping pointers along the way. Donna, thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, Andrea. We're so pleased to have you. The shop looks wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It still feels very new. Yeah, well, it is new. Only open in December. Is that right? Yes, we opened December 4th right into the holiday season. So it was very hectic, um, but we had a great first month and a great first couple of months. So um, yeah. yeah, it's been awesome. That's fantastic. So tell us a little bit about Monroe. What was sort of your inspiration for opening the shop? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I am a Charlestown local. I've lived here since 2009 um, and I've always loved retail. I've always loved, actually more than retail, I've always loved any kind of experience where people and things and environments come together and interact and kind of create something bigger. They get to feel like they're transported somewhere else. Um, my background was as a magazine editor back in the day and I covered all that st lifestyle, lifestyle type of stuff. Um, and I loved looking for things that I could bring to people and recommend that they um, discover, try out, make part of their own life and kind of transform their day to day. So, you know, all of this world was all very native to me. It was all very natural and um, I've always loved it. But after being in magazines for a while, I went for eight years to work in e-commerce uh, and learn more about the home space and, and the business side of things. And I just found myself missing that experience of going into restaurants and creating experiences and curating um, products you know, that I both got to do as an editor and also present to people on the page. So I think in the back of my mind, the whole time I was in e-commerce, I was like, someday I'm gonna open a store and I'm gonna do it my way, um, you know, choose the products that I think can inspire a little bit of, um, you know, that, that giddy feeling in people um, or that feeling that they walk into here and say, I wanna bring everything home. Yeah, and what is the Donna Garlow way? Tell us more about that. <laughs> the Donna Garlow way. Um, yeah. You know, it's, uh, I'd say my look is kind of eclectic. Um, I love to mix traditional, and bohemian, slightly more glam items together, almost in a way that's hard to put your finger on. Um, my guiding principle when I'm selecting items for the shop is, not only is it, you know, is it pretty, but with a little bit of an edge to it, uh, will it also work in Boston area homes? Will it work in these Victorian brownstones that we're surrounded by? Will it work in federal colonial homes? Like how do you make the things, the looks that are maybe boho or modern work in the homes that we live in every day and, and scale too, making sure they're not too large that they're sized for these, these types of city homes. Absolutely. And you've touched on this a little bit, but let's get into a little bit more how you sort of curate and select items for your shop. What's sort of your process there? Uh, the process is if I love it, I buy it. <laughs> um, um, but I do like to have a mix of items. There's definitely some items that are um, shockingly affordable. I mean, I've got candlesticks for $35. I've got candles for $25. i have got lots of design books and, and things that people can just say, oh, I, I didn't know I need this. I'm bringing this home today. But I've also got a few more investment pieces, some great well-made pillows. I've got lighting, um, larger furniture items, vintage Turkish rugs. Um, so it's a combination. I want everybody to be able to find something that they love here, whether it's something higher end and a splurge um, that they're just inspired by, or you know they just need a little something to, to perk up their bookshelves or, or you know, a table in their entryway. Love that. Shockingly affordable sounds like my language. It's been, it's been fun. Sometimes um, it, it's hard not to bring everything home to my own house. <laughs> Yes, it sounds very dangerous. Can you talk a little bit about perhaps um, maybe some designers or brands you might carry in the shop, some artisans? How do you go about picking those things? Well, I try as much as I can to incorporate New England made things as well as stuff from around the world and around the country. Um, some vendors that have been, or some, some um, products that have been wildly popular here are Vermont's uh, farmhouse pottery. So I have their vases, I have some of their, um, their pitchers and things like that for the kitchen and also just for around the home. And those have been super popular. Uh, the throw blankets, these wool, wonderful wool and cashmere throw blankets from Evangeline Linens in Portland, Maine have been really popular. Um, they're just luxurious and locally made. So I, I love that. Um, but a lot of other things come from, you know, I've got candles from upstate New York. I've got um, market totes from Morocco. Um, so it's kind of an unexpected mix. I like to kind of surprise people every time they come in. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I know that you're a California native, is that right? Yes, I grew up in Southern California. Yeah, anything from the West Coast we can expect to see? Well, you know, I have some great, great beach and picnic stuff coming in for the summer that I'm super Perfect. excited about. Most amazing beach chairs, umbrellas with great fringe on them, um, beach blankets with a hole in the middle for your beach umbrella. Um, really, really cute stuff that I'm excited about for, for the summer season. 
Love that. So in terms of products, let's talk about a couple other things that you're really into right now. Do you want to show us some of your favorites? Yeah. So this week, really excited. I just launched uh, my own candle line for the shop. Um, and it's in partnership with the Charles Charlestown Preservation Society. So I named them all for streets in the Charlestown area. Streets are locations. So there's Mystic, there's Henley, which is one of my favorite cobblestone streets. Um, Eden, which has got the most amazing scent that's like grapefruit and mint and felt very Eden to me. Um, and then there's Lost Village, which is a corner of Charlestown that people often don't know about. So I gave it this cool, this uh, hippie chic scent. Uh, that I thought suited the name. Um, and they come under these great glass candle domes, which can be reused later for displaying little curios, um, found things around the house. So it's um, something, a piece that'll last beyond the lifetime of the candle. Amazing. Anything else you want to share? Um, I've got great new um, rugs coming in from Turkey every week. So uh, the small mat size rugs have been really popular. They're hand knotted, they're vintage. Um, because they've seen past life and past wear, you can feel comfortable to put them in front of a, you know, a, a bath, a soaking tub or a kitchen island. Um, so those have been really popular and I'm sourcing those weekly and bringing them in. So it's always fun for people to come in and see, what do you have new? Absolutely. It's funny that you mentioned your time as a magazine editor and sort of the experience you have in, in picking things out for other people and recommending them. And now you're actually doing that hands on. You're looking at lines and you're making all of those decisions. Yeah. And for me, it's about, you know, I like to be able to tell a story through product. And yeah. the thing you can do in, in brick and mortar retail that is very hard to do in e-commerce is really editorialize and connect with people to help them understand why something needs to be in their home. I mean, one thing I sell is, is, is these French style butter bells in the kitchen area of my shop and people pick them up and they say, what is this? And I, I explained to them, oh, have you never seen a French style butter bell? This is going to change your life. So it's a fun interaction. It's a fun conversation to have with people about the objects in their home and kind of how that's going to, um, maybe change a little something about their day to day. You know, the home, the items in our home aren't just objects to acquire, but they're things we live with and interact with. So um, that's, you know, why I, I love being in retail because I get to s tell that story. Yeah, that's such a lovely approach to retail too. Yeah, people want, people want that. Um, Online shopping can be fantastic for procurement, for seeing the wide world of what's available out there, but there's nothing like the, the hands-on, the one-on-one -on -one touch of somebody picking something um, and anticipating your needs and talking to you about you know, what it's like when you bring that thing home. And hearing when they, when they come back into the store later about you know, something they gifted to somebody or something that they used or here's where it lives or here's a picture. Here's the pillow you picked, help me pick. It's on my sofa. My, cat's, my cat sit, loves to sit right next to it. So that's, that's a really fun experience to have. Absolutely, I love that. Before I let you go, I do want to ask, you mentioned beach blankets. Um, what else is coming down the pike for summer that we can be looking forward to? We have a lot of um, Turkish towels and other things like that for travel. I know that travel is on people's minds, something that we're going to be able to do in the future. So things like totes and personal accessories that are like very, very well suited to the vacations and travels that we hope to sometime soon again have. Um, I am starting to dip a toe into a little bit of apparel as well. I've got these great floaty, boxy, um, tunics that are one size fits all and just very cool for hanging around the house. So you might start to see more personal accessories um, in the shop in the coming months and definitely things with a bit of a summery vibe to them. Fantastic. Well, thank you again so much for making time to chat with me today and everyone at home, please go visit Donna at um, Monroe in Charlestown. You will not regret it. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, Donna. For our next and final segment, I'm so pleased to introduce a couple of local pros who've agreed to join me for a short and sweet panel on all things outdoor living. Please welcome landscape architect Dan Gordon, one of several experts highlighted in our feature on luxury pool design, and architect Belinda Watt, who alongside partner Michael O'Keefe dreamed up a family home on Beacon Hill, complete of course, with a sprawling roof deck offering skyline views. Welcome, Dan and Belinda. Thank you so much for being here today. 
Before we jump into a couple of questions, I'd love to have you each introduce yourselves and your firms to give our viewers at home a sense of what you do. And Belinda, I'll let you go first. Thanks. I'm an architect in Cambridge. We have a tiny firm. Um, we do quite a bit of urban work, um, do a variety of other things as well. Um, always been interested in urban design and city living. And I think that's where my, my passion really lies right now is in those types of spaces. Wonderful. And Dan? Thank you, Andrea. My name is Dan Gordon. I'm the principal of uh, Dan Gordon Landscape Architects. We're a 13-person uh, landscape architecture design studio. Um, we have offices in Wellesley and Edgartown. And we focus on custom residential design, um, things, landscapes that are thoughtfully um, designed and detailed, uh, and clearly connected to place. So that's what, that's what um, we love, and that's our passion. Great. Thank you both again so much for being here. Um, Obviously, outdoor living is an evergreen topic for summertime, but of course, we're all using our outdoor spaces a little more and a little differently this year than we have in the past. And I'm just curious to hear how that experience has played out in your work in the last year or so. And Dan, I'll have you take this question first. Well, over the last 12 months, um, clients have just been asking for the full complement of amenities and program in their landscapes. And so that's um, outdoor terraces for dining and uh, outdoor living, outdoor kitchens, pools, spas, uh, fire features are very, um, very a lot of interest with fire features, fireplaces. Um, one of the, the projects that um, actually is published in this um, issue, this current issue of Boston Home, I think really exemplifies the what clients are looking for. And that is really creating a home environment that they can enjoy their outdoor space with, um, with family and friends. And the photographs uh, in the issue are really just a vignette taken sort of on a golden summer afternoon of, uh, and I think it captures the feeling that, that our clients want. It's just a place where they can be outdoors and gather with family and friends, so. That's what, that's what we, people have been asking for. That's what we've been doing for a long time and um, just seeing a lot more interest in, in being outdoors. Yeah, absolutely. And Belinda, I know that gathering space was a really important part of the project you were working on on Beacon Hill as well. Do you wanna walk us through that a bit? Yes, I mean, so for us, even before COVID, we were getting requests for roof decks and fire pits and the project that you've, you're publishing soon has those features. Um, thankfully that had been, was built out, that had already been designed pre-COVID, but even since then we're seeing a lot more requests for outdoor living, outdoor living spaces, spaces that connect with the interior more, opening up between the interior and the exterior to really create a more of a seamless flow for, between spaces. Um, that's a, uh, that's what we're, we're experiencing too, very much along the lines of what Dan is saying. And I, I think yeah. too, um, larger outdoor dining, like larger tables, the ability to cook outside so that you're not having to go back into your house is, has been key. Absolutely, yeah. And it sounds like larger outdoor spaces are something you're noticing as a difference in perhaps the outdoor spaces that you've been tasked with in the past. Belinda or Dan, what other differences are you noticing in the requests specifically from the last year or so? Well, swimming pools. I mean, yeah. everybody, everybody wants swimming pools. And um, and then, you know, even, even things, it just, it sort of expands, you know, outdoor rooms, um, places where if a property is, is large enough, a place where you could have a destination where you could just go to hang out. So it's really just an interest in, in being outdoors and having that connection, like expanding the, the home to include the, these out, outdoor spaces. Yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned that connection. I know that's something that your firm specializes in is making sure there is that connection between the indoor and outdoor space. And I know that's something you were 
particularly proud of in the project that we're featuring in the magazine. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of that indoor outdoor connection and perhaps some ways designers who are watching this might think about facilitating that? Yeah, so indoor outdoor connection is one of those key things that we're, whenever we come to a project, it's on our radar. Yeah. Um, there's a number of things that we think about as we're designing a landscape, but that's that's key because um, that's that's how people really interact for much of the time, uh, being interior space, connecting to out, exterior outdoor space. Um, it really takes a team to, 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 do it, um, to do it well. It starts with your interiors and how they relate to outdoor space. Architecture has the opportunity to create porches and uh, pergolas that are connected for to provide transition space and add interest, I believe, to the architecture. But we're often asked to, you know, and, and in the case of the property that, that was featured, um, to provide that transition uh, from the interior to, to outdoor living space, the terrace, uh, gathering, dining uh, space. And then often the you, you really want to look at the grade changes to make that, that transition seamless. M most houses are a few feet off the ground for reasons, construction reasons. But we try to bring the terrace up and a few steps down, very close connection between the interior and, and that outdoor living space of the terrace. A few more steps maybe down to another, either your pool or your outdoor, um, out, other outdoor spaces. So that's all part of it, but it really is like the bigger picture. It's really about context. And that's key to us. We want our, we think of the landscape in, in the context of the property, the architectural context, the natural context, and so the integration and you know, the context of our um, the interior spaces. So we really want it to all tie together. We're thinking about that context. We want it to just have it all feel like um, it, it fits to the place. Absolutely, yeah. And Belinda, I'm really interested in your perspective on this as well, being more focused on interior spaces in your practice. What would you like to add? Um, definitely what, what Dan was saying about the seamless connection between inside and out. I know we really try to achieve that smooth transition. And in fact, that the project on Beacon Hill, we're about to install um, some oversized sliders there that um, will connect the interior and out and the exterior even more. Um, other things that we do, especially when a lot of our work is renovation and in existing structures is is looking at those spaces and really thinking about how to bring views in, how to bring daylight in, especially have, uh, as houses and, and other buildings have changed over the years and things become chopped up. If you can, can really think of a way to expand a view and draw light deep into the space that helps people with that sense of well being, even if they're not surrounded by the trees and the, and the plants that you would like them to be. Um, in on the Beacon Hill project that you're publishing, one of, that had a very it was a it's a deep building. It um, has uh, other condominium units in it, and some of the ways we tried to do that were creating a shower um, in the the principal bedroom that is frosted all the way up to shoulder height, but then has glass above so that you can see from the shower into the bedroom and out into the the roof line of Beacon Hill. So it's not separated the way that it used to be. Um, and uh, thinking also about light as it comes from above. It doesn't just have to be the horizontal connections, but creating skylights um, and spaces to, to really feel that natural light coming in in other ways. Certainly, yeah. And I love the idea of really thinking about what that view from inside is going to be. And I know, Dan, this is something you think about as well, making sure that your view 365 days a year is something you actually want to look at. And given that we're in New England, we are inside a lot of the time. Yeah, 365 days. Also day and night is an important factor. You, That's right. Night lighting to really extend, you know, to bring that landscape into the, into the vision um, on the dark days of winter. Um, so yeah. It's interesting that, that you mentioned, you know, light from above. I we went up to the I went up to the Sleeper McCann house um, last year before COVID, and it's a it's a large footprint, kind of a rambling house, and he introduces light into the interior spaces through skylights. And it was very, it, um, you know, ties in with what you were 
that you were pointing out. It's, it's a, an effective technique. And I'm very excited, Belinda, for people to see that primary bedroom that you were referencing and the way you did that bathroom. That was really unique and something that I personally hadn't seen before. Had you done that in other projects? Um, not that exact strategy. We do a lot. We use a lot of borrowed light where we can. So for example, in a from a shared stairwell that you might have a, a transom glass that brings light into an apartment, things like that. The the that bathroom in, in Beacon Hill is is my favorite thing about that project for sure. <laughs> yes, it's very cool. I'm very excited for everyone to take a peek at that. So to kind of shift things back to the outdoors, I'm curious, and this is always my favorite question to ask people because it's an easy one, is what you guys have your eyes on in terms of trends. What's going on in the world of landscape architecture, Dan, or Melinda, even thinking about the connection between indoor outdoor spaces that we should be thinking about and keeping our eyes on going forward? Well, should I jump in? I, yes, please, go for it. I, I think the trend is al fresco, and I think that it's in the open air. I think people always value it, so it's not like a new trend, but I think it's there's a lot of interest in it, obviously, right now. I think things are going, um, I think we're all hopeful that things are going to normalize, but I think the trend is going to last. I think there's a renewed interest in, you know, outdoor dining, outdoor socializing, just valuing outdoor space in the garden, um, exercise. Um, so like, I think it's just a trend that's going to increase that the people love being outdoors. They love being in the open air. They love nature. Um, I just see it as a, a renewed interest and a long-lasting trend that's going to continue. Absolutely. And are you seeing any interesting uses of materials and building those outdoor spaces? I'm always curious about that. Uh, well, we're always learning, you know, new techniques. Um, but, you know, we, we do a lot of things with kind of time-tested materials. Um, yeah. You know, natural stone, fire, water, light, plant materials, native plants. You know, so it's like, the kind of the, it, it, we, a lot of our landscapes are really kind of want to be tied to place and things that endure and are sustainable. So that's kind of the trend that, that we're, we're continuing with. Sure. Belinda, what's on your mind? I'd say um, similar to Dan, the, the adaptations that we've all gone through in this past year of um, trying to find ways to to see people and, and be outdoors are here to stay. I feel like, you know, the, the fire pit trend, which was already a bit of a trend, has gone gangbusters and outdoor living, like outdoor living spaces that are larger and more comfortable. So you're not just sitting outdoors at um, a wrought iron table. You've got really plush furniture out there that you can sit on and enjoy um, I know that for, for our city apartment where we live, we, um, we really extended that use into the colder seasons this year by employing um, electric blankets outdoors and just making sure everybody was far apart and everybody had their own electric blanket. And you shivered outside for an hour. Um, and so I, I see that continuing the looking for ways to people for people to be outdoors in, into the colder months where we did into New England, we did not traditionally do that. Um, but I could, can really see that being being a trend going forward. And then in terms of the interiors, um, the need for flexible space. I think, you know, people have already been talking for a while about um, open plan living and how so many families embrace these large connected spaces of living room, dining room, kitchen. And then what they found this year with being home and their children home, is that it's very hard to have two kids on Zoom and two parents working and all the other noises. Um, so I know going forward for us, creating spaces that are where we're very mindful of the need for somebody may need to work from home for a while or may need to have a child who's working from, from home for a while. Um, thinking about desks that pull out and spaces that convert. And th those are all fun things to think about. Yeah, and it certainly does seem like that is the trend going forward and something that we should all be mindful of as things progress here. Are there other things, Dan, that you wanted to add in terms of how people are 
maybe you're expecting outdoor spaces to be used differently or perhaps to Belinda's point, the continuation of the fire pit craze. No, I, uh, I think things will continue to evolve, but um, I, there's nothing that I would, I would add to that. I don't, I'm not sure I see people using, I mean, I definitely, what Belinda mentioned about extending the shoulder seasons. And, and I think that's, that's interesting because you do see it in other parts of the country and we kind of tend to do less of that. Although um, I do have clients who have like watched the Super Bowl in a snowstorm and from their hot tub, like on the large <laughs> TV. So it's, it, it's been sort of more limited like on a client basis, but I think that that's gonna probably be a trend that continues. People looking to be out, outdoors more in the shoulder season and expecting more from their landscapes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited to see that continue, particularly in the realm of outdoor dining. I feel like we've seen local restaurants get really creative this past year with using their outdoor spaces and keeping people warm and cozy during the colder months. And I can imagine that's something, as you mentioned, Belinda, we'll be seeing in residential spaces as well. I saw, um, I saw, saw somebody is making outdoor heated furniture, mm. wow. which I thought was to, the Lantern Jones. And I don't know, um, much about the brand, but it's aesthetically, it's gorgeous. The pricing isn't too crazy. And well, I'm excited to look at that because I think that would work a lot better than the electric blanket. <laughs> yeah, people are gonna love that. That's right. Can you repeat the name of the brand again? It's Galanter and Jones and it's Cast Stone. Um, I'll send you a link. Oh. Um, but I thought how, you know, I don't know how long they've been doing that for, but we could use that here. <laughs> Absolutely, great idea. So speaking of looking forward and trends and all of that, I'm wondering what's coming down the pike for you two personally in your own practices. And I'm wondering if you can offer us a sneak peek of perhaps something you might be working on right now that you're really excited about. And Belinda, I'll let you go first. Um, two of the projects that we're excited about, um, one of them is in Brookline and it's a top floor condo, but it, a, um, not a large project, um, but they would like to have access to the roof. And we've designed a retractable skylight. It's like a glass box skylight, but um, because we're having issues with roof access because of chimneys, but it will bring a lot of light down into the existing, to the heart of the existing floor plate, and then also allow for access to, to what should be a really fun roof terrace. Um, and another project is a in Vermont, we're designing a commercial building with restaurant and beer garden. And that's a project that came to us last summer. So it was after COVID had started and definitely thinking about flexibility in that space. Um, we've set it up so that it's got a large indoor outdoor fireplace and then a series of garage doors that will open to allow um, for functions, for things to happen year round, for and just because we don't know what's coming in the future for the space to be very flexible. So those are, those are two things we're, we're very happy about. That's so exciting. I can't wait to see them. Dan, what's going on with you guys? So we, we have a lot of work that's in construction this year. And um, so we're looking forward. We've got a, a beautiful property uh, on Beacon Hill that's very unique. It has a, a large courtyard, which is kind of the centerpiece that a lot of the interior space looks out on. And it's going to be an outdoor room in and of itself important spot in the, in the residence. Um, so that's that's coming along and that will be constructed over the next, uh, completed over the next few months. We also have a lot of work uh, in the Metro Boston area, um, some really beautiful, beautiful properties and a lot of ocean uh, homes, a lot of work on the Cape and on Martha's Vineyard. So we're gonna be, we're actively working on getting, getting all that constructed, uh, photographed, um, and then I would say that one of the things that's in terms of on the boards, we, there's been a lot of work, um, a lot of new work. And um, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a, a really strong team. So when the pandemic hit, we moved quickly to move remote. And because we had a really well-established team, um, we didn't really skip a beat. You know, you kind of, when you used to working with people, you can work pretty effectively with them remotely. So we've gotten a lot of work designed. And we um, have over the years, 
been innovative, our great, great staff. We do um, 3D modeling, and that starts with um, photogrammetry, where we'll take a, a, a drone, capture the, the site, the context, build the 3D model of the context, and then do use 3D modeling for design development. And the clients really, it's a helpful tool for us, and our clients love it. And so I feel like there's a lot of innovation happening in our design process. Um, so we have a combination of great work, a great team, and um, some new innovation that we're really, our clients are enjoying, we're, we're enjoying and, and seeing the benefits from. So that's kind of what, what's going on, a lot, a lot going on. It's, it's nice. It's, it's actually been a, a lot of regards. It's, um, we've been outside as landscape architects able to, to continue um, without, without missing a beat. That's wonderful. It's always nice to hear when, you know, folks like yourselves tell me that they're still busy and they're, they're still, you know, working away and have lots in the pipeline. And it's great to hear, Dan, that your team has made so many innovations in terms of your workflow. And I'm sure, Belinda, that's something you can relate to as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, very busy. I feel like if anything, we've worked more this past year than in the past with the fewer distractions of, well, since you couldn't leave your house. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, yeah, I've been very busy, very thankful that I'm in a, uh, a profession where I could keep doing that work from home because I know not everybody's so, so fortunate. So we definitely feel, feel very fortunate there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been nice to see that there have been silver linings to what has been a very crazy and stressful situation for all. So very glad to hear that you're both doing well. And thank you both again so much for making time to chat with me today and sharing your thoughts and your wisdom. It's so, so appreciated. And I'm really looking forward to having everyone see your work. So, so thankful for, for the invite, really, really. It's been fun working with all of you. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again, Dan and Belinda. Before we wrap up today, I'd just like to extend a heartfelt thanks to a few more people who helped make this issue possible. So big shout out to Site Creative, Cynthia Valens, Liz Miller, Kate Kelly, Christina Preston, Environmental Pools, RR Builders, Maddie Dewhurst, and Amy Martin. Thank you so much for sharing your time and work with us. I appreciate it so much. And lastly, of course, thanks to all of you who've taken time out of your busy work days to join us today. I sincerely appreciate your support and I look forward to hopefully connecting with you all sometime in person very soon. Thank you. <laughs>